Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Educator Excellence Committee meeting. I have the committee chair, Fraser O'Leary, uh, on, on the phone here. Um, we had some technical difficulties, but we are going to make it work this way. So I'll hand it over to you, Representative O'Leary. All right, thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, May 30th, um, 2024 at four o'clock, and we're starting our first first meeting of the Educator Excellence Committee. And um, I would like to begin by just sort of um, reading the description of what the committee's uh, goals are. <clears throat> The Educator Excellence Committee is responsible for conducting and analyzing research and outreach related to issues affecting educators in DC, including but not limited to educator preparation and effectiveness. The committee aims to inform community members, gather feedback and provide policy recommendations on critical issues directly impacting DC educators' ability to achieve excellence in their craft. Committee's work will help strengthen educators' voices by organizing public engagement events, drafting resolutions, hosting expert panels, publishing research reports, and more. Uh, today, we're going to talk about focus areas, uh, work planning, uh, the cadences for our meetings, and any questions and next steps that we have. Um, Oh, you you both received a little uh, prod to come with ideas about what we would like to talk about. Um, and I'd like to open it up uh, <clears throat> with your response to that, if that would be okay with both of you, since I can't see you. Uh, so I can't get nods. So uh, Robert, I heard you first. So would you uh, like to... Um, talk about that a little bit. Uh, sure. Um, definitely, we'll be deferring to. Sorry, the for the traffic. Uh, the two educators uh, who are on the on the committee. Uh, but I think that uh, we've long been talking about uh, teacher retention, and I think we need to continue um, with that work to to keep the momentum that has been built. Uh, already. Um, and then I think we should look at uh, the teacher evaluation systems that we use uh, in DC, uh, where um, impact is one that DCPS uses, and then our charter sector uh, is evaluating teachers also with um, all sorts of other other means to do that. Uh, interested in uh, us finding more, finding out more about what um, charter schools are doing for teacher evaluation and what we can learn from that. Um, ben, do you have uh, anything extra? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with uh, what Robert said. I think as a city, we, um, you know, still need to maintain the urgency of addressing teacher turnover. Um, but I think the piece that I'm most interested in um, and I was talking with Elizabeth Ross about this um, a month ago. They were going to be publishing workforce data at Aussie around um, how teachers come into the classroom in D.C. And in talking to members of the council and the council staff, they thought it would be um, useful if the state board studied like induction programs and induction routes to kind of get clear as to how people are coming into classrooms, you know, what programs people are using, how many people are traditionally trained, how many people are not traditionally trained, how many people are certified, how many people are not certified, to then be able to match that with how long people are staying in DC's classrooms um, to see if it could inform policymaking um, and teacher retention. So I think for me, that's one area that I feel like a report could be really useful for this committee. Um, and then also, um, you know, the, uh, question of, uh, teacher evaluation as well. Um, you know, both from the DCPS standpoint with impact and then also getting clarity on, uh, the variation and variety in the charter sector. That's great. Um, I would just like to, um, talk a little bit about the fact of 
do you think that we need to, this thing about impact and evaluation? Because the system, you know, the systems are governed by the same bodies. The uh, and I'm talking about the the state superintendent and the uh, deputy mayor and the um, the other, and then the people who are in charge of the of uh, each individual um, uh, govern school system. But the, we don't even know on the board, we've never known what the different evaluation systems look like in the charter schools. And uh, we know that the what DCPS, DCPS has now, but we have no idea about the other evaluation systems, which have to be better than impact. Um, so uh, I sort of put them in order. What, what you said last, what you said, Ben, is I'm talking about how does a teacher become, get into a school building? And then how is that teacher evaluated? And then why does that teacher leave? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think exactly. I think it's a pipeline. Um, and I think we've focused a lot recently as a city as to how people are leaving the profession, right? And we know that's a huge continuous problem. And I still think as a city, we need to like require clear, continual annual data on that. Um, but yeah, focusing on how teachers are coming into the classroom, how they're being evaluated and supported or not supported. Um and then how those factors are influencing the quality of teaching in the classroom, because we want to keep quality teachers, um, but we also uh, don't have data on that from impact or from the charter sector. Um, and even recently, you know, I was reminded that DCPS doesn't give any bonus for nationally board certified teachers. So we have no metric as a, as a, I guess I was going to say as a state, that was hopeful. Um, but as, you know, um, a city uh, to be able to reward excellence in teaching. Um, and, and that to me in turn is a big problem for teacher quality. Do the charters, do, does, does your charter school do that? Uh, I get $3,000 annually for being a nationally board certified teacher at my charter school. And then I know that some give nothing and then some give a little more. So it varies. So that, that but that is done in certain charter schools. It's not a, something that the, because you, the charter school board doesn't have any control over what each charter school does, each uh, charter school system does, right? Correct. That's my understanding. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I didn't know that at all. DC rewards teachers under impact if they are uh, highly certified. I mean, they, that's an in-house reward. I don't know, I don't know what it is now, and I I probably need to know that. Um, do either of you know that? I mean, I think it varies greatly, too, by, like, at the amount of the at-risk population that you serve um, or the um, that it's not, like, clear and consistent across the board. Um, but I would also like clarity on that, too. Um, but it's also been shown, right, that, like, financial incentives, while appreciated, you know, like, I'm not as a teacher, I'm not going to say, like, oh, I don't want to get more money for doing a job, but, like, if it is tied to student test scores, then it's been shown to not be um, an adequate reason for teachers to stay in the classroom if other things aren't um, being met. Oh, I agree completely. I'm a uh, this this is very very helpful to me. All right, because I think we what we need as I, I was looking at that uh, you you called it the pipeline. But then I, I realized that the pipeline itself that I put, that I mentioned, is kind of skewed a little bit. It should be how do teachers get in, how are teachers evaluated, and then retention. Because we know that, I, we know from our teacher retention survey that 
that I was in charge of when I first came on the board, that, that the majority of the teachers left because of impact. But that was at the end of the school year. <clears throat> right. We, we, but what you were saying, you know, we need to know how teachers get in, what kind of programs, why are they chosen? And we know that the, and, and I hope that OSI will be able to partner with us uh, on, on in this committee by giving us information and by also, because it's, it's really weird about what OSI can ask for. It used to be really bad. OSI couldn't ask for anything. Um, so under under uh, Superintendent Grant, it, it, you both know that our, well, y'all weren't on the board when um, we had no relationship with OSI at all. But I mean, you you boy, you got you came on there at the right time because uh, our relationship with Aussies. I mean, we battled with them, but but we've won the battles. I, I feel, and uh, and they've accepted that, and we got so much done in the last since since you all have been on the board. We never we had hardly anything done as far as standards, as far as any kind of. Uh, anything for the first couple of years I was on the board, more than a couple. But um, do you think that we should press for to find out what kind of information about how about the new teachers that are coming in, what their preparation is, and how are teachers assisted, especially in their first couple of years as a teacher? because we don't have any kind of information about that. And I'll just add to that, like, I think that would, under getting a better understanding of teachers as they're entering and starting in DC would then help with trying to, like, like with their retention, but also lessening the attrition, the teachers then leaving, um, which is another, I think, focus area that you all have mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think that um, I don't think it'll be. I think the first step to me is um, to contact either um, Andrew Gale or Elizabeth Ross, because she, Elizabeth was very clear that they were going to release some of this like a full work, I guess, workforce educator workforce data um, in June. So June sure. is Saturday. So I would you know love for us to kind of get access of, to that, see what exists, and then see where we go from there after we see what the numbers look like. And I can take that action item to follow up with both of them on on that. Then are you talking about like a comprehensive, uh, like we would know uh, for every teacher what their entry pathway was, or are we talking about like do, taking a sample uh, to just get some understanding of the various pathways. I think we need to know it comprehensively, um, like to really get a, a fuller look. Um, and I mean, I, yeah, I'm not going to like let, you know, um, idealism get in the way of being pragmatic too. But uh, I think, you know, like you see these random news stories like, oh, we're celebrating two teachers at Coolidge who have been teaching for over 40 years. OK, like, great. Like how, you know, we're and they went to Howard and they went to like traditional educator prep programs, um, you know, or just even looking at mid-level teachers, you know, like there's just this com conversation of like how long are te people teaching these years? Like as I'm going into my 13th year next year. Like by far and away at my school, I'm a veteran teacher, you know, and with Fraser on the call, right, he might laugh at that because, you know, that's like pales in comparison to how long he taught. So it, I think looking at the system as to how how long people have been in the the, um, the profession, um, are they effective or ineffective? Can we match that data? Not with like individual names, but just with like data points um, in the DCPS side. And then to also know um the other prep programs to be able to look at well hey if people are coming in through you know inspired teaching and they're staying 
then maybe we need to invest and expand inspired teachings model. If people are coming in through, you know, urban teachers and that's not working. And I, I'm not saying these are what they are. Right. But just thinking about that. And then we the the other thing, too, right, which could be politically interesting, is that Teach for America also has teachers in D.C. classrooms. So like some teachers stay with Teach for America and some people don't. So like I wonder what that looks like in D.C. because certain states have like Teach for America has adapted their program. Um, and in other states and cities, they've banned Teach for America teachers because the retention has been so horrible. So I, I that's the long winded answer, Robert, to your point of like, yeah, I think a comprehensive look would be good. I think that this is where I mean, I love these ideas. All right. I've been asking for information, you know, at the beginning of school, there's no reason why at the for after the first week of school, the system can't tell you how many teachers reported for work. And at the end of the first month of school, there's no reason why you can't find out how many vacancies there are in every single school in the city, because all the schools have to report that information. But that that information is completely we've never been able to get that information. And if this if this report comes out in June, it gives us a uh, a vehicle that we can use to prod the systems to align themselves and to find out information. Because like, as you know, I, I, I talk forever, but we, we used to come in and you were a temporary teacher for two years. And if you performed well enough, then you made it to probationary. And then you had a probationary status. And if you performed well enough, then you became a permanent teacher. That no longer exists. And the teachers that need the most help are the teachers that are brand new because they don't have any idea what they're doing, regardless of whatever program they come out of. They don't know what it's like to be teaching 100 or 120 or God knows 150 students who are veteran students. They've been students for a long time, and especially in the high schools. And uh, they, they, they need to be trained. They need to be assisted. They need mentors. All of those kinds of things don't exist in the system, not in DCPS at all. And to me, that's the reason why the, the, the whole system is failing as far as retaining teachers. Because, and I guess it's going to be up to us. I'm not saying this committee, but the State Board of Education to light the fire under the systems to make sure, and they have to be aligned. That's the biggest the biggest problem for me is, uh, is that the, char the charter schools don't even know what the other charter schools are doing. Right? Like, like, do you know what's going on at KIPP, uh, Ben? No. And so I think, uh, like, to, to push us towards, like, action, because I think that similar to other committees, when we have fewer, more clearly defined projects, you know, I would, you know, and I'm open to other ideas too, but it seems pretty, uh, it seems that there's support for both. One, like studying the induction programs and looking at how teachers come into DC classrooms. And then two, looking at the evaluation system, getting some data on the charter set. You're still there? No, oh, you're cutting out. Uh, oh, he's back. Okay, okay. So uh, start that thought again from uh, the induction policy. Did I cut out? Yes. I think you did. Sorry, I was talking and then maybe cut out. But yeah, I was just saying that, like, I was trying to clarify, I guess, what our goal is for today's session. And to me, like identifying two important project areas or categories would seem successful. And um, I'd like to propose like um, one setting like the induction routes and pathways into DC classroom. And then two, something with regards to teacher evaluation. What do uh, others think about that? Yeah, that, that sounds good to me. And I think uh, like 
this is ripe for uh, a very Levy teacher retention type uh, study. Um, and I, like, I agree with you, Ben, that we would want uh, comprehensive information on uh, teacher training. I'm one. I'm wondering if um, maybe a, maybe there's an interim step, like as we pr pursue what it would look like to require that information to be collected at a system level. Uh, also, doing a a study that would just show, you know, maybe maybe it ends up being a sample of that universe, but that shows uh, that is enough to to show the utility of gathering that data and to gain some insights from that. Should we use the, the teacher retention piece as kind of a um, raison d'etre for this other information? Because all I'm saying is because there's been such a problem with teacher retention, we want to study these other two things. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's true. I think they are definitely related. Um, I I also think maybe it's worth studying on its own, but um, but yeah, I, I definitely think it's worth uh, tying those together. Yeah, and I agree with what Robert's talking with what Robert said. Okay, I I um, I mean that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> But, it, but it's exciting to me. Um, I think, yeah, I think the goal of this meeting was to identify those focus areas, which I think you all have done. And then I can work with you, Representative O'Leary, as the chair to try and at least start to narrow down what that could look like. And also in future committee meetings, you all could discuss this as well. I, I, okay, I, I I would like to meet every month until we find out, uh, because I think we have enough work to do. How do you all feel about that? I think with the, with the urgency of of what we've been talking about, that I don't I don't want to let it go, and I think it's important that we um, highlight to the educational community how important it is for us to find this information. Um, I'm not saying we, I mean, we can always change. If we're, if we're rocking and rolling and don't need to meet uh, uh, or can just meet through uh, messaging and whatever, but I think that it, I'd like to meet live, to be honest with you. I'd like to sit down with the two of you in a, in a room downtown and um, and just go over stuff. Um, how do you feel about that? Oh, because we got the summer, and I, I don't. I would really. I mean, I, I you know, Ben, when we talked at the, at our business meeting uh, about not about meeting in August and then maybe not meeting in July or whatever it was, I, I'm all for not meeting meeting in July and August and not meeting in December. How do y'all feel about that? I'm only asking that because uh, I would like to, if we have to be off, and I think we do, then um, I don't want to not have a meeting. Of, I don't want to not have a public meeting in August uh, because that's it's only a, a week away from the opening of school. Teachers are already meeting in the building by the time of our public meeting in August if we have one. And, and I, I know what it was like. We, we had an emergency meeting in August, uh, the year after COVID, or yeah, the, the year um, after COVID, because they were talking about opening the school. So we extended the, we didn't have it. We had a meeting in August and it was really helpful. But that was when we were online and we had like 200 people come to a meeting. Um, but I, I, I would like to have our meeting uh, at least once a month for 2024. But I'm open. I mean, that's just how I feel about it. 
How do you all feel about that? I'm probably not going to be able to meet in person that often. Um, okay, forget the well, and, and I'll say one of the reasons why we do them virtually is so we can record them and the meetings and that's fine for you the can, public. You get that. I can I can meet with you all in person someplace. <laughs> we can have lunch, but uh, not for a meeting. But uh, do, do you, are you all right with a virtual meeting? every month uh, through December or whatever. And then okay we can uh, again to see how it's been working. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that too. Um, and then I agree with your point, Frazier, about I want a public meeting in August and I don't see the purpose of having one in July. So Jen, I don't know if you know, but is the process for doing that at the working session just to propose it for a, like, is it voted on at the working session or is it voted on at the public meeting? Well, we talked we about, we can vote on at the working session. Well, what, what you all talked about when last month at the working session in May was that it should be brought up during new business at the public meeting. And so it hasn't been voted on yet. I think that if you were to bring it up again, at next week's working session, the the recommendation would be to vote on it at the public meeting, which are only it's only a week apart this month. So yeah, it's only a week apart. And and to answer the sub answer to your question, then we can vote on that kind of thing uh, at the working session. But it's because you uh, you would be amending the schedule that's already in your binders at the public meeting. So I think from my perspective, I think that's why it has to happen at the public meeting to amend the items that are part of your existing materials. My understanding too, we we voted on the schedule at a public meeting, so we need to amend it at a public meeting. Yeah, correct. Right. So we can do that at the public, at the uh, business yeah. on yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jen, could you, can you add that to, um, new business at the working session just so i can brief or like let members know that I'll, I'll make a motion to uh amend that at the public meeting and then they can at least be aware of that for um the following week yeah i'll i can loop in um leadership and let them know that you've asked for this to be added to new business because i i'm, I'm going to be sending the agenda tomorrow as usual yeah and i heard you know eric's um you know, preference. Um, and that, that totally makes sense. But at the same time, like, I think it deserves a vote. And if the majority of members feel like that the public would be better served um, from having an August meeting as opposed to a July meeting, then I'd like for us to make that change. So what are, do you think, do, let me add something too. I think that having no public meeting in December makes sense. And, and, um, but I, but I also, well, let me take that back then. Uh, I'll forget that because I'm just rethinking that as I'm, especially as a, someone who doesn't have school age children. And, uh, cause I guess July, so we're talking about not having a meeting in July, right? Is that what the amendment would be? Yeah, that's what I'm going to propose. Robert, how do you feel about that? Uh, that's fine with me. Meet in August, not in July? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that we... Um, so are you all on for having meetings, uh, through, um, 2024? You, yes, you have agreement on that from the members. Okay. And, um, do we need to pick, we need to pick a date though. Do we want to use the same, um, Thursday uh -huh. at four o'clock? Is that okay with the two of you? I, I think it's good because like similar to the other committee 
Um, it allows for us to talk about things before the working session. So I think it can allow for the most productive flow of work. So, Six yes. Four o'clock in the afternoon, okay for you as a working teacher, though? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's, then it'll be the, um, what is this, the fourth Thursday? I guess it is. The fourth Thursday of the month? Yes. At four o'clock? So the, uh, the other thing is uh, questions and next steps. Do you have any questions about anything? I really would like to know more, Ben, um, and maybe I'll, well, no, you, since you were talking to Elizabeth Ross about it, why don't you, well, I guess Jenna's going to talk to them about. Yeah, uh, I think, I think it would be helpful. So I, as an action item, I'll, I'll connect with Elizabeth Ross about this incoming report on the educator workforce, um, what that all entails. Uh, you know, her thoughts about the induction, as uh, Representative Williams was saying. So just kind of all of those questions that we have, uh, that you all have for her. And is there anything else, other items related to the focus areas that you've identified that would be helpful to kind of um, work on or think through over the next couple of weeks? I think just knowing what oh. is reported already. Okay. Right. Well, and also, I mean, they should have a teacher retention part uh, to that workforce thing, right? Mm hmm Yeah, that's going to be a focus. And the thing I would flag too, Jen, if you could ask um, when you reach out, would be I want clarity around the status of exit surveys um, and, like, reporting exit surveys. Um, there's just been so much back and forth that like, I would just love to know like, Hey, okay. So do we have DCBS exit surveys? Do we have charter school exit surveys? Cause we're using Panorama. So like we have the ability to be able to do it cross sector. And then also when does Aussie report that? Mm -hmm. Um, because mm -hmm. I think for our committee in particular, we're going to want to have that data, um, as you know, in a useful way to be able to plan our work and do it in a way that, you know, fits the budget cycle and um, fits the next school year. And um, then just to add on to you, did you do an extra survey this year? Well, they, they you... only do, they only do exit surveys for, um, I think, teachers that are leaving the school. See that, that that you know, we need to have some kind of a uh, a survey of teachers about how how the year went, kind of thing. I mean, I went I went down at Cadozo because Edward P. Jones was at Cadozo today, and I went down to listen to him talk to students, and it was a really fabulous uh, talk. But uh, but this uh, uh, you need to go to talk to teachers at Cadozo, Ben, because it's it's not a it's not a happy place at all. Yeah, we can uh, let's talk offline about action steps there. I'm happy to follow up and support. Okay. Um. All right. So I think we've fulfilled our agenda. Are there anything? Is there anything else that you'd like to bring up? I think the only other thing for me would be um, to just uh, troubleshoot tech issues with Representative O'Leary. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, joke, um, but no, this was a this was clear. I feel good about the clarity of the um, work for the work in this committee right now. So, um, you know, excited to kind of break it into pieces and just allow the data to guide the work for us. Yeah, I, I do too. I'm excited. I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. Robert? Yeah, I feel good about the areas we've identified and uh, interested to see what steps we can take to pursue them. Yeah, I am too. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we will meet again on the, oh my goodness, um, 
I may not be able to meet on the fourth Thursday of June because uh, my only trip this summer is to Martinique for the Tony Morrison conference. And it's not, I think it's that week, but I'll let you know. That's actually great that you flagged that Frazier, um, because I'm actually out of the country that week too. So I'm wondering if for this, Robert, if it works for you, if we can move the meeting for just June to June 20th, um, which is the third Thursday, and then we could rotate back to the fourth Thursday the following month. Oh, wait, if June 25th, uh -huh. I'm not going to be in town. I thought it would be, I'm, I come back on the 27th. Is that the, oh, so the fourth Thursday is the so, 28th, right? So are you free on Thursday, June 20th? I am. Yes. Yeah, I am. Okay. Is that what you were saying, Ben? Yeah, I can't do the last Thursday of this month. Well, we can, you know, if you want to meet on the third Thursday of the month is all right with me. I mean, any... I'm 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 good for any time, but um, we'll we'll put it on the calendar for the twentieth, and okay, it be yeah, that's yeah. And Jen, the thing for me with that would just be, I think we're going to be most useful if we have the data from Aussie on the workforce report, mm -hmm. um, and so as soon as we're able to figure out when they're publicly releasing that, but when I talk to um. Elizabeth, uh, um, this was a couple months ago. She seemed to be uh, confident that it would be released by early June. Oh, good, good, good. All right. Well, Jen will find that out. And um, I will see you, uh, I hope. I don't know what happened with this thing today, but uh, <laughs> you didn't have to look at me. That's probably a plus. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Oh, I will see each other next week. Yep. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.